Welcome everybody to the Lakeside Art Centre of the University of Nottingham. My name is Michael Aykroyd and I'm the Director of the Medical Research Council Institute of Hearing Research. It is an honour to introduce tonight's inaugural lecture given by David Baggerly, the new Professor of Hearing Sciences here at the University. David's had a very distinguished career, starting in Manchester with an undergraduate degree and then Open University and then for approximately the last 15 years at Cambridge. He is possibly unique in UK audiology for having degrees in audiology, psychology, an MBA and a diploma in pastoral therapy. For the last five years he has been head of the audiological services at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, which is very much one of the best in the entire country. And he's won national and international awards and recognition. He's been editor of primary journals and he's been instrumental in many of the UK professional and patient societies, including being president of the British Society of Audiology and current president of the British Tinnitus Association. It truly is wonderful for him to join our thriving hearing and tinnitus community here in Nottingham. So, here we are, Dave, to tell us about the, the past, the present, and most excitingly, the future of tinnitus. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Welcome, and thank you indeed for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to be with you, and a pleasure to be here in Nottingham, amongst what Michael has said is an absolutely thriving community of scientists, clinicians, audiologists and researchers looking at tinnitus amongst many other exciting things. But I've come to join them. And one of the reasons I have come to join them is that in Nottingham they occupy, we occupy, this translational space, taking ideas from the basic science laboratories, feeding them through, pushing them into the clinic, but importantly, feeding them back also so the questions that clinicians ask, that patients ask, set the agenda and the mindset of the basic scientists. So essentially, uh, a good two-way flow of conversation there that I'm delighted to have become part of. But my core discipline is as an audiologist. This is a real t-shirt you can buy on the internet, so you know what to buy your audiologist friends for Christmas. Are audiologists intelligent? Are they funny? Are they attractive? All of the above. But there are a couple of other things as well. They're fortunate, as very often they get to help people. And very often, the very best audiologists are compassionate. Sometimes people think audiology is a technology profession, taking hearing aids, prescribing them, cochlear implants, and giving them Actually, what audiologists do is intervene in people's lives so that they live their lives to their full potential. So, a, a profession fueled and powered by compassion. Now, I'm delighted here to see so many people uh, who I think have got a personal interest in tinnitus and some people who've got a professional interest in tinnitus. So, it might be nice for you to see who each of you are. So without putting anybody on the spot, if you have a personal interest in tinnitus, could you just raise your hand? Thank you. Lots of people. And I beg your pardon? If you have a professional interest in tinnitus? And if you have both, raise both hands. <laughs> Yay. Okay, so you now know who you all are. Now now I, I, I was determined that that, that there would be a lay audience here, so thank you very much, people, for coming. It means my job is a little bit harder in that I need to provide things for you and for the science community, but let's work on that. And when I do your thing, let's be kind and tolerant, and when I do the science thing, let's be kind and tolerant too, and, and start that dialogue, because that's the translational dialogue too. So what we're going to do is to talk about definitions, about some past instances of thinking about tinnitus, to talk about tinnitus in the present day, to glimpse some of the future, maybe, perhaps. And then at the end, I'm going to close by talking about the particular research theme that I've chosen that's going full steam ahead, uh, very excitingly, for me at least, and to share some of those uh, new horizons with you. So what of 
definitions. This is the first definition of tinnitus in the English language. It's actually the first time tinnitus was ever used, recorded in the English language, and it comes from a physician's dictionary in the late 1600s. At the time, tinnitus was either a buzzing or a sensation and was thought to be an obstruction. And all sorts of trepanation or opening up operations were performed to try and release the trapped air from within the head or the ear of the person that was struggling. Here's the actual book itself. It's in the university library in Cambridge, and one of the librarians has tinnitus, was kind enough to get that for me. Those of you who have got very good eyesight will see one of my favourite things, which is tinnitus is right next to tickling. <laughs> it's probably the only instance where tinnitus and tickling have been linked together. Maybe somebody in the world is looking at the link between the two, but I'm not sure I've heard of that anywhere else. But a more usual definition is from an, an American ENT doctor called McFadden, who suggested tinnitus is conscious, so you know that you're hearing it. It feels like a sound. It's involuntary, so you hear it whether you want to or not. It appears in the head. Well, maybe I'd question that, as good numbers of people uh, start to hear their tinnitus in the environment or around their head or elsewhere in their body. Or perhaps it just appears to do so. So that's a reasonably helpful uh, definition. Some of you are busily writing things down or taking photos. If you want me to send you the slides, send me an email and I'll send you a PDF of the slides to save you any stress. Now, what's the impact of tinnitus and the impact of severe tinnitus? Well, it's very particular and unfortunately, as we'll see in a minute, more common than it ought to be. It's an impact of agitation, arousal and irritation, of reduced concentration, the ability to hold different pieces of information in your mind at any one time. Sleep can become fragile and collapse, and over time a person can become anxious and depressed. A Scandinavian term for that is emotional exhaustion. I think it fits really well with the experiences some tinnitus people are having. We're going to hear more from Itard, who was a French otologist in the late 1700s. But I love his quote here. An extremely irksome discomfort, which leads to profound sadness. There's something there, I think, in terms of the tinnitus condition. And here's a young man telling us about his tinnitus condition. He's happy for us to, to see this this evening and to talk about it. He's in a much better place now. He's seven. He has no hearing loss. He's not had a head injury. <coughs> He's got no particular reason to have tinnitus. But you can see his tinnitus is like a hard band across his head. When I've seen children in the clinic, I very often get them to draw a picture of themselves to tell me, their parents, their teachers about their tinnitus situation. It's a very good way of articulating it. And what I can see here is that he's physically uncomfortable and he's emotionally distressed. So that's a, an articulation there, I think, of the, the profound sadness. Now, what's the scale of the problem? Thankfully, we've got good data. And we've got good data that was first collected about uh, 200 yards from here in the Institute of Hearing Research by Professor Adrian Davis, who did an epidemiological study, so a population study, of about 34,000 people with hearing experiences, and he asked them about tinnitus, he and his team, of which I was a member for a very short period of time. About a third of adults in the UK said they've had tinnitus at some time or other. About one in ten say, yep, that lasted more than five minutes, no particular reason for it. About one in 20, it really annoyed me. And who's been referred? Between 2 and 4% of adults. That's very variable. You're less commonly referred if you're in an area of deprivation. You're less commonly referred if there are no services around for you to be referred to. Common sense, but we know that information now. And that's a big argument for tinnitus services being available across the United Kingdom. Now, that's adults. What about children? Well, one of my PhD students just last year did a systematic review 
of what's known about tinnitus in children, uh, picking up every bit of published information that she could find. And she could find papers that said 7% of children have tinnitus, other papers that say 60% of children have some time or other. So a range that was too wide to be credible. And when she looked at why that was, it was because everybody used a different definition, different age ranges, some of whom went up to 19 years old, which is not a child in Cambridge, never mind Nottingham, and uh, all sorts of different methodological problems. So too wide, really, to be credible. So a study from Bristol that I was involved in looked at an interesting cohort. There are a group of children in Bristol who get tested medically, clinically, every couple of years. And in their 11th year, somebody put a hearing test and some questions about tinnitus and about hearing sensitivity and well-defined <coughs> questions, not perfect. So they were sitting on the data and we had a look at the data and found that 3% of those children had clinically significant tinnitus. That is, it was bothersome and it was persistent. So, 3%, one child in every primary school class in England, given that there are about 30 children. And some interesting associations with mild hearing loss. We'll talk about hearing loss again in a few minutes. But some further work to be done there, I think. A mild and moderate hearing loss are a big research theme within the wider group that I'm part of. And Dr Melanie Ferguson, who's here, is a leading light and a pioneer in that regard. Sticking with the tinnitus, many people experience more than one sound and often tinnitus is highly complex, highly variable. Left-sided tinnitus for some reason is more common than right. That's the case even when you factor out the fact that many people are right-handed and hammer with their right hand and shoot from their right shoulder. There is something else going on there. Women are more likely to report tinnitus than men, but maybe they're just more sensible in talking about medical symptoms in general. The prevalence increases with age, but we've talked about children already, and increases with hearing loss, but in some complicated, subtle ways. Many people with hearing loss don't have tinnitus. And many people with quite mild hearing losses have severe tinnitus. So there's something complex there that we need to start to unravel. And unraveling is really one of the key things we need to do, because everybody with tinnitus is different. Different in their experience, different in their type of tinnitus, different in their cause, different in the effects. And that's a real, that bedevils research. That's a real constraint to research in trying to get some really good answers to these very, very important questions. Now what then of tinnitus in the past? What do we know? Well, the earliest reference to tinnitus that's known are in some cuneiform tablets from the library of ancient Babylon. There are six that mention ear disease and one of them is extensively about tinnitus. This is not the actual tablet, it's an example of the type of tablet. Tinnitus at the time was thought to be one of two things. It was thought either to be warring insects in your ear in which case you would infuse your ear with lotions and potions, or it was thought to be a spiritual affliction. And you would drive away the malevolent spirits by repeated whispered incantations. And if you look in research clinics at the moment and look at what people are doing, well, later we're going to be talking about infusing the ear with drugs, and we're going to be talking about the use of quiet meditative sound to try and reduce the starkness of the tinnitus, maybe we're not so very far away. And then Hippocrates. Hippocrates, of course, the father of modern medicine. Very interested in ear disease. Seven mentions of tinnitus in his writing. Again, various different theories and thoughts. And he mentions uh, a treatment for tinnitus that became very popular in ancient Rome. What you had to do was to get the strongest fortified wine that you could find, warm it up, dissolve as much opium in it as you could possibly do, <laughs> and drink this on as regular basis as you could manage. Stupefy. 
But when you look at what the most common treatment is for tinnitus in the United States of America this year, it's a drug called alprazolam, which is benzodiazepine. It's as addictive as an addictive thing that's really addictive, and it zones you out. It stupefies you. So maybe we're not quite as far on as we thought. This is Jean-Marie Itard. He's famous in audiology for two things. First person to call himself an otologist. That's not particularly what he's famous for. He was famous because he used to try and teach deaf children to speak. Some of the ways he used to do that, we would now think were cruel. But he had some expertise in that area. And the, the villagers in the little area where he lived found a boy aged seven who'd been living wild since he was lost since 18 months old, probably living with the wild dogs. And the boy did not speak, but the boy could hear. And Etard tried to teach the boy to speak and failed, and tried again and failed. And he said, I wonder if, I wonder if there's a critical window when you can learn to speak. And when that's gone, you can't ever then learn to speak. And of course now that seems to be the case. And that's why we move heaven and earth to find young deaf children as soon as we can to feed their brains with sound so they learn to speak in that critical window for the acquisition of language. But Etard was also famous for having written about tinnitus and was the first person to say, take your therapy sound and match it to your tinnitus. So he said, if you have a high pitch tinnitus, collect green sticks from the forest burn them on your fire, and the hissing and sizzling of the sticks will drive your high-pitched hissing and sizzling from your head. And if you have a low-pitched tinnitus, go and live next to a watermill, because the rumbling of the watermill will drive the tinnitus from your head. And it's only now, actually, that we have the ability to modulate therapy sound the tinnitus, to cloak it around the tinnitus signal, to make it similar to the tinnitus signal with new digital combination devices, again being researched elsewhere within the Biomedical Research Centre that I'm part of. And again, that's another example of, of us looking back and looking forward. And then finally, Toynbee. Toynbee was uh, an otologist who worked at Queen Mary's Hospital in London, and he's famous because he had a large connection of temporal bones. That's the bone that your ear is in. It's the hardest bone in your body. And he had a whole library of temporal bones from people with different conditions. Interestingly, he was also the uh, father of Arnold Toynbee, who is a famous social reformer. And Toynbee had terrible tinnitus and tried and tried to improve his situation, and eventually hit upon the idea one Saturday afternoon, I believe, of taking a mixture of ether and chloroform and breathing in as much of it as he could possibly manage, and he died. <laughs> so a tinnitus martyr. But actually anybody who's read the papers in the last couple of weeks, we know that people still do die with tinnitus. And I'm not going to talk about that particular tragic case that was recently in a lot of the papers, but actually maybe we're not so far on in terms of some of the things we know as well. Now what then about tinnitus in the present day? What's our present understanding? And then I'll take us on to have a look at some future things. And firstly, our modern understanding of hearing wants to talk about why on earth we hear. Because for mammals, hearing is a very evolutionary expensive sense. It's difficult to develop and uh, mammal bodies invest a lot of time and energy in hearing. So it must be doing something absolutely fundamental for survival. And the suggestion is that it's our early warning danger detection sense. The small mammals that fear the barn owl in the tree here have developed... Uh, with a, an evolutionary understanding that the barn owl is able to camouflage itself visually, but it's not able to camouflage itself acoustically. So the sense of sound develops so that the small voles and mice that the barn owl wants to eat will hear the barn owl approaching and then react and move away at the earliest possible 
opportunity. So hearing has to be sensitive, it has to be on alert all the time, and has to be plugged in to systems of reaction and arousal and emotion, and it is. Now some of you will know your auditory anatomy that the area of great interest is the cochlea, transducing the vibration of sound into electrical nerve energy with it having travelled down the ear canal and across the acicular chain, those smallest bones in your body in the middle ear. If we look inside the cochlea, here's a cochlea from the Kresge Institute in Ann Arbor where all the bone has been dissected away from the cochlea. This is a left ear, so you can see the cottage bone appearance of the cochlea there and the beautiful appearance of the vestibular labyrinth there with the semicircular canals set orthogonally to each other to capture movement in any plane and to capture acceleration as well. If we look inside the cochlea, this is from Dave Finesse and the late Carol Hackney in Kiel. What they've done here is to take a guinea pig cochlea and to uh, take away all the gelatinous membrane above it. And you can see here the two rows of hair cells an inner hair cell and an outer hair cell, which are positioned thus within the organ of corti. They're both <coughs> called hair cells. That's the only thing, essentially, that they have in common, and neither of them are actually hairs. These are little nerve cells sensitive to sound stimulation, and the inner hair cells, which number 3,000, when stimulated, speak up to the brain and tell the brain that a sound is present, and each is tuned to a particular frequency. The outer hair cells, paradoxically, are much greater in number, about 12,000, and their nerve supply comes from the brain to the ear. And there the ear's controlling, the brain's controlling hand on the ear, controlling the sensitivity of the ear, the frequency selectivity, and the discrimination of the ear. And the ear then, the cochlea, is then connected to the auditory brain, which is this beautiful cascading system of different junctions and relay stations taking sound up until the point where in the auditory cortex you're recognising it, interpreting it, analysing it and making sense of it. And as I've said, there's a pathway down from the cortex down to the cochlea, controlling, analysing supporting the cochlea in its job of transducing sound. And this can, of course, go wrong. Here's some age-related damage where both the inner and the outer hair cells have started to degenerate. And here's some noise-related damage, some normal outer hair cells there and some noise-affected outer hair cells there. You can see the devastating effect that the noise has had on the structure of the outer hair cells. And these processes of cochlear degeneration can cause the ignition of a tinnitus, can cause the point at which the tinnitus begins. But an important distinction to say is then what is the mechanism of the tinnitus being perceived within the brain? And essentially, the research scientists are looking at three mechanisms. The first is that the amount of noise within the auditory brain has increased. That's a, a, a good theory, but unhelpfully, many of the things that seem to be involved in tinnitus, like hearing loss at the level of the cochlea, decrease the amount of spontaneous activity within the brain, a rather inconvenient truth. So the further elaboration of that theory is perhaps the spontaneous activity has not increased necessarily, but perhaps it's become more synchronised. It's more in step with each other. The, the metaphor is of some squaddies walking to the pub on a Friday night, and they're walking as a rabble, and within three or four steps, they're walking in step with each other. Or all the lovely people who walked on the Millennium Bridge in London. Do you remember the bridge? Walking at random, and before long, they were walking in step with each other, and the bridge would resonate to the extent it would potentially throw a small child off the bridge into the Thames. Bad idea. So current thinking of tinnitus is thinking perhaps the auditory system has somehow got in step with itself. It's correlating its activity, so the brain thinks that must be sound. There's a compelling reason for me to think of that as sound. 
and perceives the tinnitus as more important than any other sound around it, as it's more correlated or more organised. And then a much more modern view is looking at networks within the brain. There's a group in Newcastle looking at this, some very innovative work, looking at how networks within the auditory system, but also extrinsic to that or outside that, are holding the tinnitus, promoting the tinnitus, remembering the tinnitus. That's a rather interesting idea. As I, when I've worked clinically, had many patients who would say, when I wake in the morning, <coughs> I'm not sure it's there. And then I listen for it, and there it is again, as if the brain were somehow remembering and maintaining the tinnitus. But what is the upset? What are the paradoxical sadness that we talked about? Well, here's the modern understanding of that. The suggestion of the electrical activity in the ear or the auditory nerve, perhaps increased, perhaps correlated, perhaps promoted by networks, but that filters, filters that should be blocking that, should be stopping that in its tracks, let it in, and once it's in, the build-up anxiety, fear and dismay, the persistent awareness of it, and the increase in autonomic or automatic nervous system arousal. Your autonomic nervous system does rest and digest or fight or flight. If you're the member of an audience at an inaugural lecture and you had a glass of ni nice wine and you ate something nice, you're resting and digesting. If you're the poor benighted fool who's got to give the lecture, you'll fight or flight. <laughs> so, those things are held in balance with each other. But in tinnitus, it's that increase in the agitation and arousal. And the thought, of course, is that these things are not separate, but are speaking to each other, and to each other, and to each other, building up a self-reinforcing, persistent loop that people can get stuck in. And our hope is that we can take them back to a point of habituation. That process by which you become aware, you become unaware of sensory stimuli. When you came out to listen to me this afternoon, you put your shoes on and you felt the shoe on your right foot and you haven't felt it since. But the nerve firing is still there. Or people who live next to the A52. I've had to learn some local examples of this. <laughs> How do you live here? We don't hear it. You're a liar. We don't hear it. They've habituated to it. Or fireworks night. You hear the first few fireworks, you look out of the window. Half an hour later, the council can do what they like. You're not interested. Your brain doesn't register it. Does this happen with tinnitus? Often yes. Not always. Is it possible to help it happen in tinnitus? Often yes. Not always. So what can a person do to move in that direction? Firstly, get some decent information and get some information rather than myth. There are ways of doing that. The British Tinnitus Association is an excellent source of information. I'm going to be giving you their details at the end. And this little book is, is uh, an attempt to try and give concentrated information for people in trouble. So that, that's there for you, and that's widely available. Get an informed and positive medical opinion. And if your doctor isn't informed and isn't positive, change your doctor. Sound enrichment means avoiding silence. The tinnitus will be stark and clear in a quiet environment. So have some sound around you, a fan, hearing aids if you have hearing loss. We'll talk about that in just a second. And to reduce your agitation and reaction, many, many simple techniques of either relaxation or mindfulness meditation. The two are different, quite distinct. Both of them have got very high value for tinnitus. And if you're having trouble sleeping with your tinnitus, the British Tinnitus Association have got a very, very good leaflet on something called sleep hygiene that we don't have time to get to today. But we can't switch it off. Often we can reduce impact, improve sleep, sometimes improve concentration, reduce distress, reduce awareness. Now what are the techniques that are used in the clinic? Some of the clinicians from Oak Walk House and Queen's Medical are here just now. Bedside sound generators that use the sound of the rain and the ocean by the bed or in the pillow, blending with the tinnitus rather than masking it. Hearing aids for hearing loss and there are now combination devices 
that include hearing aid circuits and sound generators, again, to blend with the tinnitus. Very new. So new, we're not quite sure how to fit them. We're not quite sure who will benefit from them. Again, really good research planned in that area, but an area where things are developing. And then the psychology community have stepped up to the mark and are talking about using cognitive behaviour therapy for tinnitus. Their argument is that your beliefs about something affects how you perceive it and how you behave. They ask us to imagine somebody standing on a busy tube platform in London. And let's say it's a bit of an unpleasant part of London. And suddenly you feel a poke in the small of your back. How are you all feeling about that? Not happy. Been imposed upon. Is there another one coming? Is there something bad going to happen? And you turn around and the person who did it is a blind person who's inadvertently hit you with their stick or their umbrella. And how do you now feel? Foolish, compassionate, relieved. And the psychologists say, look, a poke in the back is a poke in the back is a poke in the back. What's changed is your interpretation of it. So how about a tinnitus? Is a tinnitus? Is a tinnitus? Let us at these patients and we can change their interpretation of it. Interesting. And some reasonable research work actually indicating benefit there. But what really does seem to work is combining the audiology with the psychology. So this is a paper in The Lancet. I was really honoured to be part of this research group from Maastricht. And that looked at comparing standard audiology care for tinnitus with, with audiology care that involved psychology care also. And what we did was to take a group that had standard care, so a hearing test, basic information, a hearing aid or a sound generator, and importantly, going to talk to somebody who would be nice to you, but not psychologically trained and not directive. <coughs> And comparing that with a group that had the standard care and then tinnitus counselling for exactly the same amount of time, just doing something different. So this was a design that for the first time controlled for the counselling effects. Good numbers in the group's well-designed study. And at 12 months, the specialised care in group improved in terms of quality of life, in terms of the severity of the tinnitus, in terms of their impairment with the tinnitus. So the headline news is, if we manage distress and fear, as well as managing hearing, maybe there's benefit there. Maybe there is benefit there. And later work went on to say, well, this was more expensive, but was it cost effective? And the answer was, it was, because the benefits were sustained, so patients didn't need to come back to see another audiologist, or another ENT or another doctor of some other kind to try and get some benefits on their tinnitus journey. What then of the future? What future hope do we have in regard for tinnitus? Well, firstly, there's hope in that the community now is collaborating and sharing knowledge. This is a review paper. There are many other tinnitus review papers, but one that I wrote and again in a decent journal with an ENT and with Professor Deb Hall, who's one of my uh, colleagues within the Biomedical Research Unit, and with Michael, is the other Professor of Hearing Science in Nottingham. And we threw everything we knew into this paper so people could critique it, get frustrated with it, be provoked by it, to, and to, in order to get the attention of the wider medical community. Some indications that it has started to work. So what's happening? Well, one of the first things that's happening is there are a good number of uh, new technology approaches. Don't have time to go quite through them all, but let's just pick up a couple. Mute button was invented in Southern Ireland. And if you have troublesome tinnitus, you listen to a tone being played while you electrically stimulate your tongue. The thought by the researchers being that they are are able there somehow to unlock the plasticity of the brain to try and detune the tinnitus. Anti-tinnitus is a little patch that you wear behind your ear with a local anaesthetic in it, which has been shown to work on tinnitus if it's infused into the bloodstream, but is very, very dangerous. But does the patch get into the ear? The others, you can see there are some techniques that put a notch in your favourite music, 
around the tinnitus frequencies. There are others that boost the frequencies of your favourite music around the tinnitus. Very different approaches. Now, what else is new? Well, if this cognitive behaviour stuff, therapy stuff works, why can't it be more available? And one of the reasons it can't be more available is because there are very few psychologists who are interested in doing that work. So there are two emergent approaches here. The first that I've been involved in is ICBT, which is Internet Delivered CBT. This is a program where somebody with tinnitus works through a series of modules guided by an audiologist who's available for them by phone or via email. It's password protected and they move between these different modules and we're assessing in a clinical trial at the moment whether this is the same, better or worse than standard care. Indications at the moment are encouraging but I would say that because I'm one of the people who developed it. In Nottingham, a different approach is being taken, and Dr. Derek Hoare, who's sitting just up there, is providing audiologists with a manual for doing cognitive behaviour therapy in audiology clinics. So it can be done safely and effectively and cheaply where the tinnitus patients are. And that's being very rigorously evaluated to get it absolutely right. And drug trials are going on. In general, there are two approaches. One is infusing drugs within the ear, particularly in very new tinnitus. A drug recently was trialled which seemed to have some benefits for people with very severe tinnitus and people with tinnitus due to infection didn't have benefit in the wider tinnitus population. Disappointing. And then another drug which looked at changing the way the brainstem responded to tinnitus, where the auditory nerve comes into the spinal cord and joins the brain. That was changing the way that potassium is used between nerve fibres to signal to each other. Again, disappointing, but real drugs in real people in real clinics. And I think getting the drug companies involved here is very, very important. Now, in my last few minutes of closing, let me tell you about the work that I'm particularly going to be doing, and then we can have time for some general discussion. And you know that cancer is immensely common around the world, but treatment is better than it has ever been. People with cancer are living longer, and more of them are living, and there are large numbers of them, and that's growing. Majority of them are adults. Why is that relevant to me? Well, a lot of the treatments that are used, particularly the chemotherapy that's based on platinum drugs, which is immensely helpful and effective is toxic to the inner ear and can lead to hearing loss and tinnitus. And 20% of men receiving cisplatin and surviving testicular cancer have a severe, profound hearing loss. Four in ten of them develop tinnitus. And the oncologists used to justify this, used to justify it well by saying, look, I've saved your life. But then some patients say, yes, but this is not a life, or this is not a life with quality of life because of hearing loss and tinnitus. So there's a, a clinical issue here to do with the way that these things are done. And in particular, the cisplatin, the most commonly used platinum ototoxicity, gives people a progressive bilateral, so both ears, high frequency hearing loss, causing difficulty hearing and noise, isolation, communication in people perhaps who are already burdened. And the tinnitus that it can cause can lead to insomnia, agitation and reduced mood in people who always already are carrying a burden of their cancer disease and treatment. Here's a quote from some oncologists who are waking up to this. What may seem to be trivial, drug-induced toxicity has the potential to change quality of life and functional capacity. Drugs meant to treat can become the source of interference in the activities of daily living and treatment compliance may be jeopardised. People might step away from these chemotherapy treatments because of the toxicity that's being caused. And here's a case that came to me just about seven months ago in the clinic I was in in Cambridge. Should I continue with my treatment, she asked. She was 24, relatively late stage ovarian cancer, planning a marriage, planning a house move, was awaiting round three of six chemotherapy 
treatment, she developed a high frequency hearing loss, so her inner ear was affected. That was mild, but what was not mild was the bilateral both ear tinnitus that she was having, causing her sleep to collapse, her mood to collapse. The marriage was on hold, the move was on hold, she wasn't working, and I'm prepared to stop my treatment because if this got any worse at all, I couldn't manage. Will it, uh, uh, will further treatment make it worse? And we don't know. We can't populate that equation. Thankfully, in her case, it didn't. She went on with treatment without it. She'd have lived 18 months with it. She has a good life expectancy of five years. But we can't populate that equation unless we know who, what, why, where and when. And here's a case where an adult patient drawing themselves in the midst of platinum <coughs> chemotherapy on steroids. So she's driven... She's drawn the puffy face that she had, but you can see the cacophony of the tinnitus around her, defining her in that difficult, challenging situation. What's causing the hearing loss and the tinnitus? Well, the, the organ of corti, this area here, is well sealed and well protected. The body does not want viruses or toxins in there, but the route into the cochlea is through this area here, which is like a, a coating around the wall of the snail shell of the cochlea, called the stria vascularis, and it's the metabolic engine of the cochlea. It's where lots of, of uh, metabolic processes, so, so uh, processes that enable the cochlea to work with energy and to work as effectively as it does, taken, and that's the way that these drugs can enter into the endolymph or the cochlear fluid there and affect the inner, the inner and the outer hair cells there. It's most commonly the outer hair cells that are affected as they're slightly more vulnerable due to the way that they work. But there's a big problem with the large numbers of studies that we're looking at. We're looking at the moment one particular chemotherapy drug called carboplatin because I thought there'd be fewer papers written about carboplatin and hearing, and the research group that I work with and I, I've got a thousand papers to read as quickly as we can to try and work through that. There's a lot of work in this area, but it's not good. The numbers are small, the testing hasn't been right, they haven't made enough account of the complexity of things that people are having. You can see the other issues there. There are big problems with the literature. The best study is some work that comes from the States group based in Indianapolis, and they've calculated the cumulative dose of cisplatin in 488 patients surviving testicular cancer, and they map how much hearing loss you have with a low dose, how much hearing loss you have with the high dose. With the higher dose, which is the more usual dose, 55% of these men had a moderate hearing loss or worse. That's life changing. It is hard to live a modern professional family life with a moderate hearing loss. Out of these 488 patients, exactly 1.4% of them had been given hearing aids. So there's a clinical problem here that people aren't, there's a big problem and people aren't getting the care that they need. So what we're going to be looking at is the who, what, where, when, how and why of this. Who is susceptible? Is it genetic? Is it the fact you have a hearing loss already? Is it your age? It appears to be the very young, the very elderly are more susceptible. And when does it happen? That's rather important for one particular reason I'll tell you about in a moment. Does it happen later on in the, the chemotherapy cycle or does it happen earlier on? So we're pulling out every bit of research we can find to try and get to the bottom of this. Secondly, there are some ways now that patients can test their own hearing. And this is important because every oncologist knows their patients on these drugs should be being tested, but vanishingly few of them have the tests because the test is hard to do. It involves a soundproof room and an audiologist, and these patients are often tired and sick and don't want to go to hospital again another time just to have <coughs> a hearing test. So what we're trying to do is to find a hearing test that patients can do, just like the blood test they do, just like the blood pressure test they do, just like the temperature that's taken every time they have the drug. There are at least four different types of self-testing that can be done, so we're urgently reviewing the technology there. And then we're looking at when does the hearing loss occur with chemotherapy, what pattern does it follow, and how much long-term trouble 
does it cause in terms of tinnitus and hearing loss. So we're applying for money for each of those areas to try and get research themes there with the overall aim of protecting the cochlea. At the moment, anything you do to protect the cochlea protects the cancer, reduces the efficacy of the anti-cancer drug. But we've got to look at ways of protecting the cochlea and we're starting to get an idea that may be some ways of phasing that in time that would allow the, the, the platinum-based chemotherapy to reduce the tumour, but we then later protect the cochlea as it becomes vulnerable. I've got a team of people working with me, John and Bonnie are over in that corner. Krista's starting to work on the uh, self-test area and colleagues uh, within the university, the university Hospital Trust really stepping up with very, very great interest there. Now, if I've piqued your interest, there are some ways of chasing this conversation further, progressing it further forward. The British Tinnitus Association would love to hear from you. There's their website. <coughs> if you're in, interested in joining a tinnitus support group, they'd love to hear from you. There are ways of organising those and supporting those, whether you're the person today that's come from Henley or the person that's come from Crawley. Thank you very much for doing your motorway travel to come and hear me. If you're interested in research, then they produce what's effectively a free book about tinnitus research every year. Uh, we're just finishing the 2017 version there. So in summary, what I hope to have told you is that past, present and future tinnitus is a fascinating topic, but a tremendous amount of work going on to move this area forward and for us to get some really effective treatment and prevention. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Now, we do have some time for questions. Michael, do you want to chair that? Yes, thank you, David, for a brilliant introduction to tinnitus and emphasising the importance. Understanding, treating and trying to prevent tinnitus. Many of us have it. I'm sure the rest of us will get it. When you have it, you know that you just want to cure it as quickly as you possibly can. And Dave and his team at the BRC are at the forefront of international attempts to try and do that. Any questions on the floor? Yeah, so I'll just really, um, research into environmental or lifestyle or dietary factors in Thank you. The microphone's making its way to people, but I'll repeat that question. And thank you for making it a general question, because clearly I can't answer personal or treatment questions across the floor here. So the question was, has there been any research into environmental or dietary factors? Did I remember that right? Lifestyle, Lifestyle factors. There has been. Again, it's not been particularly good. There are some suggestions that uh, people with ongoing chronic stress in their lives react more strongly to tinnitus when they get it and have less resilience there, and that's common sense, really. There are some factors that have been linked with increased tinnitus, like blood pressure or smoking or recreational drug use, but often these aren't properly controlled, so it's all a bit murky. As a result, there are quite a lot of myths around, and you'll see lots of do not do lists for tinnitus. And I think uh, one list that I saw had red wine, cheese, red meat, milk, almost anything that's any fun to have in life whatsoever, <laughs> chocolate, really no risk, coffee, no research basis for that. When those things have been looked at in particular, it collapses. But it takes a lot of time, energy and money to look seriously at each of those things. And it's only relatively recently that the tinnitus research community has gone from being amateur into being professional, collaborative, and all the things that I hope I've shared for you. So thank you. Yeah, the, the tinnitus I have, I have a constant droning in my head. It's completely separate to my hearing. I've had hearing tests, and the tests are fine. I've got no problem with that. You didn't really, what you went to, you, you associated everything there with the hearing, through the hearing. Is, is that usual? Uh, it didn't come up in that? Okay, so let's generalise your question, yeah. if I may. Uh, and I was making the implication that, that, that an awful lot of tinnitus 
is associated with the inner ear and the brain and the way that they do their dance together, both the hearing brain and the emotional brain as well. There are some other types of tinnitus that are not related to that. There are some types of tinnitus that are due to problems in the middle ear, so the muscles contracting <coughs> and going into spasm, very particular sensations people get of clicking sound and fluttering in their ears. And then there are other types of tinnitus that appear to be pulsatile, so mimicking the uh, sound of the pulse in your head or in your body. And that's worth a, a good medical opinion in that case, because there are some things that need excluding in that situation. Sometimes it turns out to be pulse-related, so cardiac synchronous. Other times it seems to be completely dissociated and to be mimicking the pulse, but it's worth asking the question. I'm really pleased that you mentioned children in your um, presentation. And I'm just wondering about whether there's been any research into the links between dyslexia and um, tinnitus and whether that's something that's going to be looked at. But also about the support groups for children because a lot of the support is around adults and not children with quite severe tinnitus. Thank you. So uh, the suggestion was over specific research linking dyslexia and tinnitus. There's been some speculation, but I haven't seen anything that's rigorously, rigorously looked at that. But it may well be that I just haven't seen it. But one of the great uh, pioneers of dyslexia work, Dorothy Bishop, has done quite a lot of hearing work in the past and does talk to the hearing community. So there's uh, an interplay there. Uh, then you spoke about support for children. Now the British Tinnitus Association run a course for professionals dealing with tinnitus in children. So people's expertise is starting to be spread and are looking at the resources that might be available. There are some books that they produce for children with tinnitus written in age appropriate language and for the first time with really decent design so it looks as good as the books that the kid would be reading I don't know what kids read these days. My kids read Captain Underpants, which wasn't particularly good uh, artwork, but these, these are, are, are well produced. So, so the, again, the community is waking up to, to realise there's an issue here. The, the people we're not necessarily taking this with us yet is the education community, the teachers. And the one child in every class, perhaps, is a way into saying to the, the education community, you will have some children in your school with these issues. You've mentioned uh, cancer and the treatment of it and its effect on tinnitus. And uh, I'm wondering what research uh, is there on uh, noise and uh, as a cause of tinnitus when people are exposed to a lot of noise. Thank you. There's a tremendous amount of research into noise as a provocation for tinnitus. And some of it is good. One of the big areas of research at the moment is in the people who've been exposed to noise and think that they have got away with it because their hearing test hasn't changed. And the suggestion is in those <coughs> cases, the hair cells might be intact, but they might not be the most vulnerable part of the inner ear and the nerve. It may well be that the nerve synapses or junctions have deteriorated. And there's a a lot of work going on around the world looking at that particular population and Becky here, you want to wave your hand, is, is, has got a big project looking at patients like that, testing them very rigorously and using magnetic resonance imaging, famously invented not far from here as well, and uh, trying to draw out some of the things that's happening there. Because this, in a sense, is the ticking time bomb of people who are being exposed to noise now, not noticing a hearing loss particularly, but storing up fragility and vulnerability later on in life. And if I got that right, you can buy me a cup of tea, and if I got it wrong, you can tell me in the morning. Hi. Um, I pick up on one of your slides there where you mentioned avoiding silence. Now, I have uh, acoustic trauma, and I'm pretty like, no doubt, other people here, very bad, very loud tinnitus. Um, 
But I have noticed occasionally when I've been in the bathroom, I won't say what I'm doing there, but I'm, I'm contemplating my toenails, basically. And I've found that um, actually if I concentrate on trying to reduce the sound, I can actually get it down to what appears to me to be something like 10%. I never quite get it there all the way. But it seems that to me that the silence or the acoustics in the, the silence of the acoustics, if you like, in the bathroom are somehow reducing it just temporarily. Thank I don't you. know whether you can comment on that. That's very helpful indeed. Uh, avoiding silence is a general advice and there are two big flaws with it. It's good advice, but there are two big flaws with it. One is that people can become obsessed by avoiding silence and carry sound with them all the time and fear being in the presence of their tinnitus, which, of course, potentiates it, makes it worse, because you're frightened of having it. If you don't even go to the loo because the tinnitus will be there with the TV not on, then you're going to carry some kind of sound-generating device with you just in case you hear it. But there are several approaches now that are looking at whether you should consciously pay attention to your tinnitus and try and reduce it. And in particular, mindfulness meditation says that if you have a problem, a fear, a pain, an issue in your life, then you should lean into it, become aware of it, coexist with it, and by doing so, you will manage it. And that potentially is part of what you're doing. It's difficult to know, but I've certainly heard that sort of situation before, and it's excellent that you've got that kind of conscious control over it. And what that means for some people, again, generalising it, is if you feel you've got some conscious control over something, you no longer feel helpless and vulnerable, because you know you can influence it, and that's very important. So thank you. Hi. Uh, a few months ago, I think it was last summer, I went on a study at the Hearing Research Centre over the way there uh, and was fed a sound through headphones uh, that had been uh, sort of assembled over a period of time with, with test sound. So, in effect, it was white noise. had the uh, remarkable effect of removing the tinnitus, albeit for three or four seconds. Um, but you mentioned a little earlier about a new generation of hearing aids, I'll call them, with the possibility of noise generation. What is the current state of play on those? Okay, so t several, several responses. So you were, you were in the biomedical research unit, as it was then, in the summer, which uh, was before my time. So like every new prime minister, when they're told about the uh, failings of their predecessors, I can say, before my time. So, uh, but it, it sounds as though it's beneficial for you because you experience something called residual inhibition. In the 1980s, we used to test tinnitus patients for this all the time, get them to listen to a minute of sound and time how long they, their tinnitus was reduced for or sometimes absent for before it broke back in. And then this became really, really unfashionable, but it's become an area of interest again, and people are looking at that. So that's called residual inhibition. Now, you asked about the combination sound generators. The technologies are fantastic. We can shape sound, we can use sound. The latest devices, we can Bluetooth sound. They're not available on the health service quite yet, but they'll, they will be in time. And we can Bluetooth sound like the rain and the ocean into the devices, so the sound of your choice is with you. But we don't yet know quite what protocols to use to fit them, who will benefit for them, how cost effective they are, and what the long-term benefits are. So we're applying for work here, Magda is here, Dr. Sereda is applying for a large grant to look at that. Uh, to try and work out the feasibility of a study that would address some of those questions so that we in the clinical community don't do the same thing that the technologies are doing of pushing things out there before we really know what the benefit is. Maybe if we just take one more. Hello there. Um, I'd like to ask about sleep. We hear a lot about sleep, that it's difficult if you've got tinnitus and therefore we can try and mask it, etc. But I'd like to ask, can sleep actually make tinnitus worse by increasing the brain activity while you're asleep? 
Thank you. I think there is, there, there is an effect, and certainly I saw a patient last week where their tinnitus changes every time they sleep and they wake fearfully not knowing what state they're going to be in. Uh, but I think it's not necessarily sleep so much that changes, it's the process of waking. <coughs> And when you awake, particularly after a catnap, and a lot of tinnitus people say catnaps are disastrous, because when they wake from a catnap, the tinnitus is, is, is reignited by that, and you're nodding and, and agreeing. So I think we need to look at what happens in the brain when we wake from sleep, and what those processes of, of rapid activation are, and how they are drawing the tinnitus up in their wake, and pulling the tinnitus up with it. So I think that, that's an area... Of, of interest, but people are already looking at my to-do list and saying, you might be being a bit ambitious there, David, so I think I'll leave that to some of my colleagues to look at. Michael, okay. the one thing, as, as we close, is to say I think the drinks and some of the food is still available until 7.30. Okay, in that case, I'll, I'll ask the very last question quite, quite quickly. Dave, you said the clinical reports of tinnitus go back three and a half thousand years to the ancient Babylonians. What's your guess of us, us actually have to do something about tinnitus in the next five or ten years? Oh, you can always trust your friends to ask the most difficult question, can't you? Okay, you're off the Christmas list. Uh, when, when I started working with tinnitus, which was over 30 years ago, I used to go to lectures that said, in five years we'll have cracked this. And I go to lectures now and people say, in five years we'll have cracked it. And we are further on, and the community is talking, and there are really good programmes of, of research getting funded and going forward. Not enough. Not nearly enough, but there are, there are signs of progress. But, so I'm not sure I can put a figure on it. I think five years would be highly optimistic, particularly if a drug is involved. You'd probably be talking 10 or 15 there. But clearly, I think cautious optimism has to be the order of the day. OK. Thank you, David. Um, just so everybody knows, this has been recorded, so it will be available online soon, so you can re-watch it and pass it on to everybody else that you've seen. Okay.